In this video, we'll discuss the theory of religion by William James, who is considered the father of American psychology, one of the founders of pragmatism and one of the most influential American philosophers. Our focus will be on his famous work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which had a significant impact on many intellectuals including Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein. What does it mean to live in the world of William James? Why is the study of personal spiritual experience more important than the study of history and doctrines of organized religion? Can we measure truth by its utility? In what ways was James brilliant and in what ways was he possibly wrong? These and many other questions we are about to discuss in this video. Those of you who follow my channel possibly remember how we counterpointed some ideas of pioneers of sociology of religion, Durkheim and Weber. In this video, however, we'll compare ideas of two pioneers in psychology of religion. They are James and Freud. Just like Freud, James saw close ties between psychology and religion. And if Freud represents one pole of this relationship, where religion is viewed as something destructive, James clearly demonstrates the opposite. He found in religious experience amazing power to heal the wounded personality and inspire moral action. Unlike Freud, James did not dismiss religious experiences as mere delusion, but sought to understand their psychological and emotional significance. Both scholars eventually found devoted disciples, and in a sense, their opposing views are still very much alive. The Varieties of Religious Experience was published in 1902. It was the result of lectures that James delivered at the University of Edinburgh in 1901-1902. The book immediately resonated widely within the scientific community and was repeatedly reprinted in various languages. To this day, it remains a classic among psychologists and philosophers worldwide. So what did James share that was so significant and remarkable? Well, he talked about how we should study religion. He thought it was most important to focus on personal religious feelings and mystical experiences. Similar to Rudolf Otto or Friedrich Schleiermacher, James approached religion from a phenomenological rather than functionalist approach. In other words, to him it was important to understand religion not externally, but from the perspective of a believer. Unlike Durkheim, who places great importance on the social aspect, or Weber, who is focused on doctrines or what people believe, for James, the significance and value of religion are determined by its usefulness to the individual who practices it. In this sense, a person must decide whether something is meaningful and beneficial specifically for them. Eventually, James came up with the next definition of religion. Religion, therefore, shall mean for us the feelings, acts and experiences of individual men in their solitude so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Were you able to catch how this definition puts much of what we normally associate with religion to the side? He intentionally ignores religious institutions, doctrines, rituals or ceremonies. He is not interested in theory or various religious leaders or in looking at a community of believers. All the beliefs, practices and organizations are secondary. They come after and arise from the primary fact, which is to be found in the personal experience of individuals. They are the heart of faith and the center of all religion. That is why for James, if we want to understand religion, we need to pay close attention to people who claim they had intense and dramatic mystical experiences, those who have seen visions or heard voices. Therefore, other conventional believers who simply follow religion culturally as a custom could be ignored. They cannot tell us much about religion. Another dimension of it is the focus uh, not on submission to the divine, but also to the desire to understand oneself. Professor Catherine Lofton of Yale University even stated that today we live in the world of William James, a world of multiple identities where religion is no longer about theology or submission to the divine. We no longer strive to understand God, instead we seek to understand ourselves. The main goal of spiritual practice is to narrate yourself. What was important to James is the effect that a certain event or experience had on a person. And it doesn't really matter whether this experience was true or not. James would say that 
Something may be a real historic event, but if it hasn't had an effect, then who cares about its historical truth? On the other hand, something may not be historically true, but if it has had an impact on you and changed your life, then it is something really important and it can be a subject of study for a scholar. Even if people experience some sort of illusion, but if thousands of people over thousands of years tell us about similar experiences again and again, clearly something is going on and we can study it. James himself doesn't provide the clear answers, uh, he is open to interpretations and doesn't necessarily seek to understand mystical experiences only from a naturalistic perspective. For example, James might say, oh, we don't know what happened to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Perhaps he simply suffered from epilepsy and had a hallucination, but because of this event he completely reconsidered his faith and became a person who had perhaps the greatest impact on our world. Such experiences have indeed changed the world we live in today. Another argument uh, is that so-called medical materialists, whom James criticizes, are quick to attribute religious experience uh, to purely physical causes or psychophysical disorders, uh, such as sexual tension, epileptic seizure or nervous dysfunction. But to James, such physical causes don't really explain much about human experience or belief. We can explain atheism or faith with these same causes. So, attributing such experiences to physical causes doesn't provide evidence, either negative or positive, about the actual content of religious beliefs. For example, if we were to learn that Isaac Newton struggled with chronic depression or epilepsy, it's not a reason to reject his loss of motion or theory of gravitation. And James writes, in the natural sciences and industrial arts, it never occurs to anyone to try to refute opinions by showing up uh, their author's neurotic constitution. Opinions here are invariably tested by logic and experiment, no matter what their author's neurological type. It shouldn't be no otherwise with religious opinions. In other words, uh, religious opinions should be judged based on their own terms immediate luminousness, philosophical reasonableness and moral helpfulness are the only available criteria, according to James. In his work, James provides multiple examples of religious experiences and tries to identify their common features. I can't know if you personally appreciate such approach, but for those who haven't personally had mystical experiences in their lives, it could be very interesting. After all, the book is like an open window into the lives of those for whom religion is a matter of life or death. Between its pages, uh, you'll find numerous stories where individuals share their transcendent experiences from their perspective. This way, through James's work, the reader can step into the mind of a religious person and see the world through their eyes. James also wants to show that uh, there are other kinds of dimensions that are not available to us. And here he reminds me of Thomas Nagel's work, What is it like to be a bad, that some scholars call the most widely cited and influential thought experiment about consciousness. Just think of dogs that live in our world with us, but don't understand it the way we do. And just as they don't understand our world, there is a world around us that we do not understand. James refers to it as the unseen order of the universe or unseen reality. In his 1890 work, The Principles of Psychology, James explained that there is a connection between our capacity for mental experience and the material substance of our body. Of course, he means brain. Uh, please note that it happened in 1890. And already back then, James admitted that damaging the brain will affect mental functions. If the nervous communication be cut off between the brain and other parts, the experiences of those other parts are non-existent for the mind. The eye is blind, the ear deaf, the hand insensible and motionless. The same would happen if the brain were influenced by chemical substances, stimulants or psychedelics. James explains that throughout history, theologians, philosophers and most humans always thought that uh, human beings are composed of a body and a soul. They assume bodies have souls, the soul controls the body and the two can be separated at death. Some believers also think uh, they can be rejoined at the end of time. In other words, uh, one substance is material and mortal, the other non-material and eternal. But James explains that is not how science sees them. 
Body and soul are not separable entities. They are two intimately interwoven aspects of the same living organism. And we must think of this soul not as a thing, but as a process, as a river of feelings, ideas and images pouring through the physical network of the brain. The physical and mental aspects of the self are fitted to each other like a river and valley. Again, it was back in the 19th century. James also was against the idea of distinguishing human knowledge and human feelings. We should not think that our feelings and our rational intellect are two completely different sides of our nature. In the principles of psychology, James suggests that the science of the mind should include the study of behavior, uh, which is psychology, the study of the biological basis of behavior, which is neurobiology, and the study of mental phenomena themselves, which is introspection and phenomenology. The first two approaches are widely acknowledged and practiced today. However, the third approach is often ignored. But James argued that the empirical study of mental experience is crucial for the science of the mind. Introspective observation is what we have to rely on first and foremost and always. The word introspection need hardly be defined. It means, of course, the looking into our own minds and reporting what we there discover. But think about it. To conduct such introspective observation requires constant inner attention. Do you think it's easy to look inside your own mind? Give it a try. Like in meditation, focus just on your breath for 30 seconds without thinking about anything else. Trust me, it's not an easy thing to do. James wrote, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. That's why it's not surprising that James had a particular interest in Buddhism. For over millennia, this tradition focused on methods of training attention and observing the mind. Even today, we see how the Dalai Lama and his team try to convince contemporary neuroscientists to investigate the methods and knowledge accumulated by Buddhists over centuries. They believe that collaboration between the two groups could produce extremely beneficial insights for modern science. It's also important to note that throughout his lifetime, James went through serious personal issues. As Daniel Pulse describes, during and after his medical studies, James struggled with mental depression and pessimism. Back in 1898, something special happened to James while he was in the mountains and he saw it as a really important spiritual experience that made him curious about such moments. Uh, this curiosity led him to study such experiences and deliver the Gifford lectures, what eventually led him in the writing of this book. It's worth mentioning that James lived during a time when Christianity was undergoing a liberalization, uh, challenging its hierarchical structure. Many individuals, while still considering themselves Christians, stopped attending churches, Many people debated about the relevance of the institutionalized religion. And as we see it, uh, James too wasn't interested in organized religion, but rather in the personal experience of individuals. That's why if you want to understand, for example, Lutheran Christianity or Orthodox Judaism or Islam, uh, the works of William James aren't the best place to look. Also, James lived during a time when various alternative beliefs were flourishing. Practices like spiritualism, fortune-telling, attempts to communicate with the spirits of the deceased, or theosophy of Madame Blavatsky was extremely popular, especially among the elite. For instance, father of William James was intrigued by the religious mystical teaching of Emanuel Swedenborg. Swedenborg claimed to have traveled to the spiritual world and described what he saw in heaven and hell. And this influence likely had an impact on James as well. We see that throughout his life uh, he wanted to investigate various anomalous psychological phenomena. For instance, telepathic communication between individuals, uh, contacts with dead people by mediums, and so on. Uh, no surprise, he engaged in parapsychological experiments and explored spiritualism. He even deliberately consumed alcohol and psychedelics to induce such experiences. James believed that study of various anomalous psychological phenomena should be the next stage in Western science's exploration of the mind. He envisioned a breakthrough in psychology when there will appear some sort of Galileo who would revolutionize our understanding of the mind. 
Overall, James believed that religion can play a positive role in people's lives and even to some extent alleviate them from psychological disorders. Interestingly, when James himself had mystical experiences, they were not positive and led him into depression, so he knew that such experiences can also be negative. But when he tried to answer the questions like uh, why is religion important to someone or why does a person seek God, uh, James thought it's because religion provides harmony. However, different religions offer different harmonies. Uh, according to James, uh, Catholicism provides spiritual peace, while Calvinism, on the contrary, compels the soul to search for itself, a kind of harmony through self-discovery. And there are at least two kinds of people, according to James, healthy-minded and sick souls. Some are fundamentally healthy-minded, affirming and optimistic. Others are more darkly disposed, more inclined to notice evil or to lean toward pessimism. They are the sick souls. At the same time, James acknowledged that in his work, he devoted too much attention to presenting facts and too little to philosophical analysis. The problem with this approach is that James refuses to discuss questions related to what actually exists or the ontology of religious and mystical experiences. He shifted his focus to the psychological issues of these experiences. Therefore, uh, later he faced criticism for disregarding the social and historical context in which experiences occur. He essentially set aside theology and psychology, showing no interest in theory, but only in real experience. He believed that we are currently facing the beginning of the unknown, recognizing that right now there is a lot we simply can't understand. So now I suggest to consider some critiques of the works and arguments of James. Some scholars point that the formula of definition of religious experience that James suggests uh, has serious limitations. On one hand, he wants to present it as something universal and applicable to all humans. But if we compare what Christian and Buddhists desire, theologically it would be absolutely opposite things. While one wants to have eternal life in heaven, the other wants to achieve the state of nothingness or non-existence. Also, when James talks about the religious experience, he presents it as the powerful and welcoming feeling of renewal, a sense of personal joy, contentment, or a new search of empowerment. But as soon as we try to define these feelings as religious, we have a problem. After all, a morning walk can produce a sense of joy. A glass of wine brings satisfaction. Falling in love brings blissful surrender. But none of these things is religious. Carl Sagan and many other completely secular people could describe their sense of awe when they learn about our universe, but it has nothing to do with religion. Science can also be a source of awe and mystery. Not only religion, but science through the mystery of nature or through dreams about the future can create the whole paradigm of feelings, experiences and imaginations. Maybe to some it could be a religious experience, but other people would not define it as religious. So it can be universally religious to all. In other words, as Pauls writes, James seems to insist on kind of experience that cannot be religious if truly universal and cannot be universal if truly religious. Another critique is that James commits to studying religion scientifically. So it's fair to ask how scientific he is with his evidence, especially as presented in the varieties of religious experience. In this work, he proposes to make a universal argument, applicable to all of human religious experience. But when we read his work, we see that the vast majority of the reports he considers come from Protestant Christians, especially evangelicals from England or America. Those are normally people who always emphasize the importance of their conversion or born-again experience. Yes, he briefly mentions cases of a few Catholics, but it's still Christianity. But what about other cultures outside of the Western world? Well, almost nothing. Also, James focuses too much not on representatives of conventional and more developed religious groups, but rather on newly emerged, often marginal religious movements. As I've mentioned before, he himself was a fan of spiritualism and various occult movements of his days. Daniel Pulse reminds, among these groups, there was a keen interest in religious experience based on the quite unproven premise that better emotional health will guarantee better physical health. 
or that one could make contact with deceased loved ones on the other side. They were thus open to manipulation by charlatans claiming dubious psychic and spiritual powers. Today we know that uh, this notion that emotional health will guarantee better physical health uh, has been debunked by multiple studies. There are many medical conditions or genetic issues that cannot be improved simply by the power of positive thinking. For instance, James insists on the value of prayer, considering it an objective scientific fact that prayer can heal diseases. Here he was probably under the influence of mesmerism and perhaps Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science. But did James have an empirical proof for such a claim? In fact, he presents value judgments in favor of prayer without condemning groups like Christian Science for doctrines that led many people to reject traditional medicine relying instead on the power of prayer or spiritual practices. Even today, many people die sometimes from trivial illnesses that could be cured by almost any rural doctor who has just basic understanding of medicine. Many people suffer and die simply because they are ignorant about the illness they have. And it's strange that James strongly opposed physiological explanation for mystical experiences. He called such an approach medical materialism, but why did he reject it? Yes, people do have mystical experiences, including out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, hallucinations, sleep paralysis, visions of deceased relatives, and so on. But why not explore a natural explanation for this? Many intellectuals criticize James for ignoring experimental science, when even mystical experiences of people can undergo critical analysis. Yet, James didn't want to approach them as Freud did, through the lens of mental deviations that could be cured. He seems to believe that even if these experiences are considered pathological, they still have a positive impact and can provide a sense of peace, comfort and hope. Therefore, he speaks highly of Quakers and their founder George Fox. While acknowledging that from the point of view of his nervous constitution, Fox was a psychopath, James emphasizes the importance of such individuals in helping thousands of others feel better. Their intense spiritual experiences, according to James, serve as inspiration for the greater good, and this is what's really important. Some people also argue that James was biased and relied on blind faith, not bothering to search for the truth. They think he didn't care about evidence and even encouraged superstitions. Of course, many people find this kind of thinking okay, but if you pretend to provide a comprehensive theory of religion, some colleagues might see this approach as too narrow. The problem also lies in how James understood consciousness. On one hand, James was a strong Darwinist, seemingly one of the first to put forth serious theories of mental and social development through the lens of evolution, uh, he also emphasized the necessity of experiments, but for some reason not for every phenomenon. Overall, James was a brilliant scientist for his time. He simply lacked data on how the human brain functions. And it's fine, since many great scientists have made mistakes and continue to do so today. It might be fair to say that if James or Descartes or Kepler has visited the 21st century, they might acknowledge some flaws in their ideas. If James engaged with modern psychiatrists, geneticists or neuroscientists and saw how medicine can address certain mental issues which James himself faced, he would probably change his stance on some of his conclusions. Kepler also was a genius of his time, but he probably believed that there are living beings on the moon. James was correct in saying that uh, when people have high temperature and fever, uh, they can have religious experiences that could seriously impact their lives. But why not look into why this happened and uh, use modern medicine to stop it? After all, we can already help many people with schizophrenia so they don't suffer from hallucinations. Allow me to provide a thought experiment. Imagine your friend goes camping and spends a night in a tent in the forest. Then they hear strange sounds, uh, which they interpret as the voice of the devil. Frightened, this person becomes very religious. From this day on, their daily life and values completely change. They interpreted it as a calling from heaven. They decided to drop their studies at university and their job and instead go to a monastery. But what if you knew that what your friend interpreted as an extraordinary experience in fact has a perfectly natural explanation? It was just a bird, 
and your friend shouldn't fear the devil just because of strange sound in the forest. Will you try to explain it to your friend or will you let them completely change their lifestyle and worldview if they find comfort in it? Listen to the sounds of the Thunderbird or Storm Petrel, which some people call the Devil's Bird. Or here is an example of the Kookaburra Bird. Uh, let's listen for a couple of seconds. So, how would you feel lying in dark forest in a tent and hearing such sounds? Another criticism comes from philosophers such as Bertrand Russell and George Edward Moore. Uh, they asked, uh, what does James actually mean when he claims that we measure truth by its utility, when he says that we discover what is true by determining that is good? And James was convinced that neither materialism nor monism but pragmatism are the key to understanding religion. George Moore, however, said that it appears that James wants to make utility the sole criterion of truth, so that only useful beliefs should be judged true and false beliefs judged useless. But it can be applied for all cases, and not only from the philosophical but also from a very practical perspective in our daily life. Bertrand Russell concludes that the problem with using utility as our sole or even chief guide to the truth of religious belief is that it omits as unimportant the question whether God really is in his heaven. Judging the truth or a belief by how it works in action is itself highly problematic. For example, were the effects of the French Revolution good or bad? Can we say that it was good because the beliefs of those who led it were true or bad because they were false? Such a way of thinking is problematic. It doesn't of course mean that uh, philosophical pragmatism is completely useless when we theorize about religion, but it obviously has serious shortcomings. In the end, it's important to note that, uh, like any thinker or individual, James changed his opinions and attitudes towards many phenomena over the course of his life. In addition, the Harvard colleague of William James, George Santayana, suggested that James himself was less than persuaded by his own arguments. There was no sense of security, no joy in James's apology for personal religion. He did not really believe. He merely believed in the right of believing, that you might be right if you believed. It reminds me of Daniel Dennett's idea that people prefer to believe in belief. And yet we owe James a lot. He inspired many to think seriously about the close ties between psychology and religion. Many intellectuals highly appreciate James's work, especially in terms of the amount of data he managed to gather. His work is a treasure trove of knowledge about the human phenomenon of religion. It laid the foundation for the psychology of religion. But as we may see, James's approach is the opposite to Freud. They both want to unlock secrets of the human mind. On one hand, they both started with medicine and physiology, but then turned to psychology. And they both wanted to understand the nature of the mind and the role of religion. But James looks to faith as a source of meaning, as a healer, and as a force for good in the world. And Freud finds such faith a neurotic delusion. It is a symptom of mental illness that must be cured with the help of psychiatry. When Freud first advanced his revolutionary ideas in Vienna, James expressed genuine interest. He found Freud's overall idea of the unconscious very intriguing and helped introduce Freud to American discussion. And he saw psychoanalysis as just one of many interesting paths in modern psychology. So, not surprisingly, he chose different paths in his intellectual journey. Of course, uh, many would disagree with James's chosen methodology and recommend considering his works in the light of modern knowledge. In the last century, the field of psychology of religion has transformed tremendously, but both James and Freud will always remain among the most celebrated and ambitious pioneers of this field. So, is James too focused on individual meaning? 
Is his definition of religion too narrow? You decide, my friends. Finally, I just would add that it's not easy to call James's work a theory of religion. He more describes and systematizes biographical religious experiences, although it's worth noting that he does it brilliantly, and I highly recommend reading his book. Thank you for watching until the end. I appreciate your likes and comments as it helps more people to see this video. Please check out my other videos on the channel and support its work if you wish. The links are in the description. Finally, special thanks to my patrons on Patreon, Dabur and Adam. Please join them. I wish you peace and health wherever you are.